Good evening, everyone. I hope you can hear me and you can see me. Can you hear and can you see me? I'm not sure if you can hear me and if you can see me. Uh, hope everyone is doing well. Can I just get a quick confirmation? that I can be heard and you can see me in it seems there is oh, again something is not right here yes thank you Phil sound and vision is good thank you so what I'm gonna do is now um, yes I can hear the sounds now it seems we are working um, I am gonna join um, I'm gonna go to Canada and we will have Dan Gibson with us and we will be questioning Dan Gibson regarding the research he did. I am guessing some of you read this book called um, uh, Early Islamic Kiblais. So we will be talking about this book. We will be talking about a couple of the mosques I've been mentioned in this book and uh, we will be keeping Islam accountable. So let me just give me a minute. I'll just call Dan Gibson and then we take it from there. Hello. 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 Peace of Christ be with you, Dan. How are you? I am fine. And you? By God's grace, I am good. Thank you. Uh, can I just get a um, quick check from audience from YouTube if you can hear and if you can see Dan Gibson? So, um, we are live, Dan Gibson. Okay. Um, can I just get a quick permission from you that you are okay to be recorded on this live stream? Yes, uh, it's perfectly fine. I'm expecting it. Good, 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 good. You never know what happens with YouTube. And right. How are you, sir? I am good. What have you been doing these days? Oh, I'm uh, studying. I'm still doing more research. The research never ends. And making YouTube videos. I have my own channel, so if people yeah. want to go there, they can see some of the YouTube videos there as well. Okay. So, um, please fill me in. I'll just introduce you a little bit. I come across with your book on Quranic geography a couple of years ago, which I thought it was amazingly helpful to to us also some Muslims who think generally. generally. Also, last year, or maybe it's been two years now, I come across your book on um, early Islamic Kublais. Right. Um, so beside doing research and writing, what do you do? Um, mostly I research and write. That's what I spend all my time doing. Okay. Sometimes up to 60 hours a week. So I don't have much other life than that. Okay. <laughs> so you are based in Canada? I am based in Canada now. We were in the Middle East for many years. And uh, then I lived near Vancouver for a number of years. And uh, now I'm out in, uh, in the middle of the prairies uh, in Canada. So far away from any big cities. Okay. Is that because it is easier to do writings? No, it's also, it is, I can concentrate and also family is around. So I'm with family now. Okay. Uh, did you just have Thanksgiving or you are going to have Thanksgiving? Uh, no, Canadians had Thanksgiving a month ago already, more than a month oh. ago. Okay. That's because in Canada it's cold right now. There's snow outside, so it's, uh, we're in the middle of winter. Okay. England is not as cold as it's supposed to be, but outside is beautiful with God's creation. Yes. So, uh, the, the snow is beautiful too. Oh, well, God's creation is beautiful. Our God it is, is amazing. That's right. So um, what I thought, um, if that's okay with you, um, we look at tonight is mainly talk about uh, your book on early Islamic Kiblais and then um, try to understand what it, what it is all about. 
So those of you who are joining us on YouTube, remember our topic topic is early Islamic Qiblais. So please, please keep your conversations around the topic so that everyone can um, participate, participate well. And if you have any question, please uh, write add in front of DCCI Ministries. It will get my attention and we can ask that to our guest. And please keep your comments in English and kind and nice. Freedom of speech is encouraged, but please do not abuse the freedom of speech. Um, so, um, Dan Gibson, before you put this book together, um, Early Islamic Qiblais, you put together Quranic geography. Can yes. I just have a little bit background of it? Where did it all come from? Why, why would you do that? We have to back up a little bit farther behind that. Um, I, I was in the Middle East. I had spent, well, I've spent many, many years in the Middle East. But at this point, I had a contract with the Jordanian government to produce some materials. The project was to take what the archaeologists were writing and to produce materials that common everyday people could understand that could be sold to tourists and to other people who were interested in what was going on. So I had to go through all the archaeological reports and all the materials and produce things for a common people. And that was the first book called The Nabataeans. And so while I was studying that, I became aware of some difficulties uh, with history. Um, I was, I have been studying and was very familiar with the history of uh, biblical history as well as the history of the Arabian Peninsula. And uh, I was aware, I mean, of this history of the biblical stuff and the Greeks and the Romans and of the Nabataeans, I, writing a book on the Nabataeans, making the website and doing all the research. I realized that the history that I was looking at of Arabia was very different from what my Muslim friends were telling me, that when Muhammad came, it was just tribes out in the desert, and they were all fighting with each other. And I couldn't put the two histories together. You know, so I have the history coming from uh, from uh, the the known history from that the West has, and then I have the other history, which I knew about going back to Muhammad, and they didn't seem to match. Yeah. And I kept thinking, there, there's a problem here. And I would always tell my friends, someday somebody's got to look into this and match up the early Islamic history with the, the history we know of the Middle East and of the Nabataean people. And uh, I just left it at that. And by several years went by, many years went by, and I, I kept looking at it and thinking every once in a while. And one time I was in uh, in Europe, I was teaching at a college, and uh, I realized suddenly I had nothing to do in the afternoon. I was teaching all morning. I had not brought any work with me. So I went to the library, and I found the book Sirat al-Rasul Allah, which is the story of the Prophet Muhammad. It's, uh, it's the story that's been put together of uh, Ibn Ishaq. And so I decided I would read that and I would think about the geography because I knew the geography of the Middle East. I'd been in all the countries of the Middle East pretty well. And I had spent years in Yemen. I'd spent time up in Jordan, was out with the, uh, in Petra and out with Bedouin. And so as I read through that, I began to think through the history and suddenly it made sense only if the city of Mecca was in the north of Arabia because they would march out of uh, Medina to the north. The Quraysh would attack from the north down to the south. And as I read through it, I thought, you know, there's something to this, uh, that, uh, that the founding of Islam was in the northern part of Arabia. But I said to myself, I said to my wife, I cannot study this because I would need at least a year to just read everything, read the early accounts, read the later accounts, try to figure it out. And so I did not tackle it until I think it was about the year 2009 that I got a sabbatical and I was able to take one year and I said, I'm going to study this year. I'm going to try to look at both histories and see if I can fit them together somehow. And one of the first things I did is I remembered that mosques face towards Jerusalem, the first mosques. This is what all my Muslim friends told me. We always prayed to Jerusalem. 
And in my travels, I'd come across a number of mosques that the people at the mosque said, this mosque faces Jerusalem. But I had found quite a few mosques like that, that people had said, our mosque faces Jerusalem, and that's why the, the first mosque was here, and then the new mosque faces Mecca. So I decided to just make a little chart and uh, put down these mosques that face Jerusalem. And then I decided to measure things. Back then, we started using a GPS. When we were out in the desert looking at Nabataean things, we always carried a GPS. This is before a GPS was in your cell phone. And so we had to have an actual manual GPS and look at it. So if we found something in the desert, we could mark down the, the, the actual uh, coordinates where that find was. So if we saw some writing on a rock, we would write, you know, down this is the GPS coordinates so somebody else could find it later. So I decided now I've got satellites, I can go to these mosques and I can just double check to make sure that they are pointing Jerusalem because people sometimes are just talking. They just say things. So I started visiting mosques and that's when I got the big surprise. Because as I visited mosques, I started to discover that there were mosques that did not face Mecca and Saudi Arabia, and they did not face uh, towards uh, uh, Jerusalem. And so I started to make a list of these mo uh, mosques and take a map and start drawing the lines. Where do these mosques point to? From the south, from the east, from the west, from the north. And I began to realize these mosques point to the very area that I was studying. That was the big shock. That I had been studying the city of Petra. I had been there uh, with a, a permission from the Jordanian government. I had gone 60 times in and out of the Petra area and cataloged everything. I had spoken to all the archaeologists who were digging at the time. I had made up reports. I had written a book. And suddenly, these mosques seemed to be pointing to this area. Now, I had traveled all over that area, up and down all the wadis and over all the hills. And so it's, it was just fascinating to me, how could these mosques point to this place? So my study took uh, two different prongs to it. One of them was these Qibla. The Qibla is the direction that a person prays towards in a mosque. So the mosque is designed so that people can pray in a particular direction. So it's, it just means the direction that people face. And uh, the second thing was, how do I fit that over top of Islamic history? Because I, nobody had ever said anything about the Qibla facing any other direction than either to Jerusalem or to, uh, to Mecca and Saudi Arabia. So suddenly I started really poring over Islamic history. I had to read all the hadiths. I needed to read the histories. I needed to try to put together a picture of how did this work. So two studies, one is the Qiblas, and the second one is how do these Qiblas fit in Islamic history, and what can Islamic history tell us about Qibla directions? Okay. Um, let me just um, help um, those of um, those of people who are watching through YouTube. Why, at the first place, that um, Muslims were uh, turning their face towards Jerusalem than the Mecca? So, Muslims pray five times a day, and as they set up their prayer today in 21st century, most Muslims are turning their face towards Mecca towards Kaaba. It is because, according to Surah 2, verse 142 to 45, I'll just read the um, import, like I just read the parts which I think it's um, interesting. This is Surah 2, verse 142 to 145. So there was a point. Time, time and place Muslims are praying to different direction than Allah steps in and in verse 144 tells we have certainly seen the turning of your face O Muhammad towards the heaven and we will surely turn you to Qibla with which you will be pleased so turn your face towards Masjid al-Haram 
always changing direction of the prayer from somewhere towards the Masjid Al Haram in the intention Allah wants to please Muhammad. So, which you will be pleased. Hmm. Um, of course, we will have lots of questions on that part. So, Quran doesn't tell us at the first place it was Jerusalem. Is that correct, Dan Gibson? That's correct. It does okay. not tell us that. And nowhere in the Quran does it mention Jerusalem. And most of the hadiths do not mention Jerusalem as well. I've yes. only found one or two places that will mention Jerusalem. Yeah, so that's miracle of Islam. Miracle of Islam. So, as you kind of try to notice, actually, no, those mosques are not facing towards Jerusalem. Neither they are facing towards Mecca. Um, I'm just a bit curious, how were you able to find a um, place of... Um, uh, I forgot the name. Masjid Al Haram? No. No. I mean, um, the the Quran doesn't tell Muhammad where to pray towards as well. It doesn't say where he was praying, and it doesn't give the name of the city towards which he should pray. Yes. So when you look in your Quran, you'll only find the word Mecca used once in the Quran. And some people argue it's there twice. They may argue about the word Becca. But the Quran doesn't name names of places. I did a study. When I did the book up, uh, Quranic Geography, that, this is the first book that I wrote. Right at the beginning, I listed all of the places in the Quran that are listed, all of the geographical references. And I came up with the entire Quran with nine places mentioned in the Quran. Many of them are not clear because it talks about the people of the ditch, for instance. Now, where and what? If you don't know the history, you don't know where that place is. So there are actually very, very few places in the Quran that you actually have a geographical name. And so this is the problem we have with uh, the city of Mecca. Muslims will tell me, whoops, Muslims will tell me that this is the city of Mecca because it says here the Kaaba. Well, the Kaaba is a building uh, that has the black rock in the side. But they're assuming the Kaaba was always in Mecca, but it doesn't say Mecca. It talks about the Kaaba. It talks about the, the holy house. Okay, now Muslims are assuming the holy house was always in Mecca, but the, the Quran doesn't say Mecca. It just says the holy house. Uh, they assume that when it talks about Masjid al-Haram, this is the forbidder, forbidden gathering place for bowing down. Um, masjid is a place of bowing down and uh, haram is forbidden. So they assume when it talks about Masjid al-Haram that this is Mecca in Saudi Arabia. But the Quran doesn't say that it's Mecca in Saudi Arabia. It just talks about Masjid al-Haram. So this is the problem with geography. The Quran is not specific. And so we do not know from the Quran where they prayed before. We do not know from the Quran the city to which they prayed later because the city is not named. Therefore, the Quran is very vague on this. So when we come, the way to tell this, I believe, is then to go and look at the mosques. Visit a mosque, see where the mosque is. This is where the people lined up. You can always tell because a mosque is wider than it is deep. And there is a wall that is known as the Qibla wall because Muslims line up shoulder to shoulder in long lines facing one wall. And so that is known as the Qibla wall. That's the wall for the, they pray towards. So we can visit a mosque. We can go in and see where the Qibla is and then um, oftentimes, now in the first uh, 50, 60 years of Islam, they did not mark the wall in any way. It was only later that they hung a sign originally um, in a couple of the mosques, and then they started putting a mark on the wall, and eventually they built a concave, uh, I don't know what would you call it, sort of a dome on the outside, uh, a wall there so that they could pray towards that. That's called the mihrab, and that's the the mark, so you go into a mosque today, there's a mihrab, we can we know which way to pray. 
But the earliest mosques did not have a mark. You simply have to find the longest wall. And this is the wall. And you can see how it's constructed. It's very easy to walk in and say, this is how it works. And the people line up in lines, usually because there's pillars. And so you, you can see how they can line up. And we can see which way the, the mosque is oriented. And so I began to check the actual buildings. Many of these buildings had been destroyed and rebuilt and destroyed and rebuilt. So I couldn't measure because I can't see the original building. And so I might be looking at a building that's only 500 years old or maybe one that's only two or 300 years old. So I had to go back and find the oldest mosques that I could measure and then place them on a map and try to find out where was Masjid al-Haram and the Kaaba and the, the, the holy city and where was, you know, all these things that are described here, the, the, the house, the holy house, the sacred house and so forth. And uh, that's when I started to get this uh, map with the directions pointing not at Mecca in Saudi Arabia, but pointing north. And it was in the region of the city of Petra. So um, let me just try to... Um break it down a little bit so okay in 708 um that was the date that is the date for the introduction of the mira right okay so now i use i use quranic geography because in the back there is a timetable and i'm always flipping back here because this helps me know what year she's talking about because i prefer dates in hijra and she oh. wants 708 which is 89 <laughs> after the hijra okay this is the very earliest. The mihrab is invented here, and it's used in uh, at this point for people uh, to to point their mosques towards Mecca and Saudi Arabia. So mihrab is the um, sign usually on the wall that when Muslims stand for prayer, that's where they face them. Okay? That is correct. So today. You can just turn up the Regent Park Mosque or any mosque, wherever you are. It is very easy to put that together because it's on the wall. It is very visible. Yes. So we are talking about the mosques 1,400 years ago. Yeah. Uh, can you just break it down for me once again? How were you able to find mosque which was built before 708? before the official mihrab has been introduced, how okay. were you able to find direction of the um, prayer? Generally, the entire building is oriented towards the direction of prayer, okay. and there is a Qibla wall. There is a wall, so there is an area where people can line up and face that Qibla direction. Very often, there is a later mihrab, added to that uh, mosque. So very often you, uh, you might find the mihrab for Mecca in the corner, but that you can, but it will have a date there. We can, we can see when that was added at a later date. And so when a mosque has two kiblas, it has one here and it has one here. These are called kiblatain mosques. The tain doubles the Qibla, so it means there's two Qiblas in that mosque. So there are some early mosques which are Qibla tain. Uh, I found three, four of them, and uh, they are clearly marked with two Qiblas on the wall. Um, but most of the early mosques um, were abandoned at some time, and these are the ones I can go and check because they were built, and later they were abandoned, the building knocked down, and so forth. So now we can go back and, uh, and look, many times archaeologists have dug up the ruins and they say, here is the mosque, and we can go and check that mosque. And usually it's just a foundation. All you're looking at is the foundation because the rest of the building has gone because it's so old that they've reused many of the stones in something else. Yeah, so um, when, as you kind of went to, went to these places and then, uh, try to find out where is the direction of the prayer, which you did. Let me just pick a mosque in Egypt, for example. Ah. We are talking around 600, 700s. They didn't yeah. have a uh, Samsung phone. They didn't have Apple computers. Therefore, 
wouldn't you wouldn't wouldn't you say actually yeah it's okay if they did not get the direction correct let's say sake of the argument it was always mecca okay yeah. uh, uh, islamic tradition is all correct abraham build the kaaba he, he, uh, and then muhammad comes to confirm that all those kind of things it it has always been there but people did not have the technology to get the right direction Yes, this is a argument I've faced many times. And um, there is something to this because one of the arguments we face is uh, what I would call specificity. How specific can you be? For instance, if um, I have people measuring mosques and they'll say, oh, I measured it and I got 0.3 degrees different than you. Okay, and I'm like, 0.3 degrees. I mean, the, the difference is nothing. so, it's nothing, but for them, oh, but you have to be accurate. And they want to be accurate too within, a, you know, a, a small degree. Um, I don't believe the early builders were that accurate. And I don't know if you can measure a mosque with being that accurate. Oftentimes when we got to a mosque, let me just use an example. Here's a mosque building. If we decided this is the Qibla wall, Sometimes we would have to run a rope all the way out here to make it even bigger so that we could measure this long distance because it's very hard to measure something that may be only 30 or 40 feet long. So, I mean, you make it wider and then we can measure it a little more accurately. So there is the struggle with measuring the actual building. Now, a couple, well, a few years ago now, it's not very long ago that we uh, satellite photos were suddenly made available to us. And by uh, this, we've been able to, you, we can access satellite photos of varying degrees of accuracy. The most accurate satellite photos are held by military. And so they are able to measure things. And, you know, they talk about maybe they could read the newspaper you're holding. I don't know how good their cameras are. But um, the satellite imagery at the beginning was blurry, but over the years, it has become better and better and better. And different countries have put up different satellites. Japan has an amazing set of satellites, uh, images from all over the world for studying plants that are growing and where they are and so forth, and uh, the temperature of things. But they have amazingly accurate uh, images that we can get a hold of. So we can measure from satellite we can also go to the mosque and actually visit it and look. And that's what I suggest for every mosque. If I possibly uh, can get there, I will get there. If I cannot get there, I make sure that another, ask if another researcher can get there, someone who understands what they're researching. And otherwise, I've used other people as well and just try to, to get people to go there, take pictures, uh, take some measurements and check them so we can make sure what we're looking at down from a satellite is what we're actually seeing on the ground. Because yeah. you, once you get inside a building or at the spot, you might recognize, okay, actually, we're not looking at this correctly from above and, and it, it, it's slightly different. Um, for instance, in... Um, uh, down in Africa, there's uh, a couple of mosques there, and uh, one of them is a Qiblatain. It has two Qiblas, but the only way you can tell is to actually visit the mosque because they're both in the same wall. One is pointing one way and one is pointing slightly the other way. You cannot see that from space. And fortunately, we were able to get there and, and look at that mosque because just in the last year or two, that Qibla wall has crashed down and uh, you can't measure it anymore. So, I mean, you can measure it very generally, but you can't be uh, more specific because you can't be there to see what's there on the ground. So I've tried to measure mosques. I continue. So when you get to this book... Um, there's a couple of things in this book that are not quite accurate. I mean, the measuring is accurate. The conclusion is not actually accurate because I didn't see the bigger picture. So when we published this book here, this one is in um, 2010. This one, what year is this? I think it's 16 or 17. I'll have to check. Yes, 2017. So this is seven years later. Uh, this book came out and it has charts and I thought we were pretty well finished. So we published this book. 
thinking this is all the data and more data comes in, more mosques have come in. As we've gone on the internet and have made some videos and as we made the film, a documentary film, and now we've allowed people to, to uh, contact us, lots more suggestions are coming in. What about this mosque? What about this mosque in my hometown? Or what? And suddenly we're looking again. So now we've got uh, on the internet something we call the Kibla tool. And I'll ask you at some point to put up the address. You can go on the internet and you can look at this tool. It lists all the mosques that we have so far. Actually, the tool is not even up to date. I have uh, several more mosques on my computer waiting to be added to the tool. So this thing keeps growing because we're trying to find every mosque from this period of time. I remember when I first came out with this book, I, one man was very angry at me. He said, you've just picked and choosed. And I know I was looking for every mosque I could find. But over time, we found more mosques and more mosques. So the Kibla tool is up to date. And we have uh, over 100 mosques there that we look at from the first 200 years of Islam and trying to tell the story and figure out what do these mosques tell us by their different Qibla directions. Yeah, so um, those of you who are watching from YouTube, first book Dan Gibson is talking about is the Quranic geography. So first, that's the one we read, and then we move to the second one, which is called um, Islamic Qiblais, early Islamic Qiblais. So that's the order of the book. You, you will find it's helpful. Right. Um, I guess my problem, uh, not my problem, actually. I guess problem Islam is supposed to have or Muslims are supposed to have is or the questions they will have. And by the way, I am aware that um, in the different part of the world where certain group of Muslims now decided to uh, turn their face towards Petra as they pray and they are trying to do their Hajj towards Petra. I am aware of that. But my question would be in the lines of, for example, um, Ubay bin Kaab. He's one of the disciple, uh, not disciple, sahaba, sahaba of Muhammad. Um, or other sahabas, as they were, like I know Muhammad couldn't read and write, all those kind of things. But as uh, other sahabas, they were building the mosques. Um, what were they using as a tool? Like which side for the what? What is the side of the um, Mecca? What is the side of Petra that they got this all mixed? If it is at the first place in the Mecca, what the Muslims were using in seventh century, eighth century, I'll go until ninth century. You want to go into the the explanation of how they found the Qibla direction? Yeah, like Kay. how did they, like how, how like today. Like, I, for example, I came from, if for, I can just put my phone and then my phone tells me where to go. Right. But in 7th century, they didn't have those things. How did people knew where they need to put their mihrab so that they get the direction correct? How were they um, able to know at the first place how to do so? We, we have... A couple of problems here in getting this information. One is that there is very little literature from this period of time. We can't just go and look at other things that were written in Arabia at that time. Because we're in a, um, a, a literature, a literary vacuum. We have the Quran, but we don't have any other literature alongside of it. We can't go and compare it with something else written there. So what we have to do is end up going to the Hadiths and the histories, all of them written two or 300 years later, yeah. and all trying to go back. And then we can go even farther on, and we can go to more books that were written following that. So we can go four, five, six hundred years later. Now, 600 years later, there's lots of books that have been written at this time. So... Um, and they have lots of opinions. Uh, and so we have to look and decide where are we getting our information from. So um, we don't have anything from 7th century and 
8th century tells us how Muhammad his, and his followers and caliphs were able to uh, find how they need to build their mosque towards Mecca. That's right. Okay. Now, we have some clues. And uh, they come to us from various places. And there are several methods that have been suggested. Um, I don't know if you want to get into technical explanation, but some of them are not technical at all. For instance... Um, um, I, um, I want to keep it simple. Yes. The main reason is because I am female host of the program and I know Muslims believe I am deficient in mind. So oh. what I'm going to what I'm going to do is now I'm going to show to this um, Kubla tool on the screen. OK. OK. And I also put this in the description of this video. So what I want, um, if that's OK with you, first, I want you to tell us how we use this. Okay, uh, what, what are you putting use... on the screen? Because I can't see your screen. So oh, yes, just a moment. Share screen. This or divide it up for me. Okay. Um. Sorry, there is something practically not happening in this site. Um, okay, tell me which picture you're putting on the screen. So I've, I've got this website um, called thesecretcity.ca. CA from Canada. That's the sacred city. That is the name of the documentary film we made. So you can yeah. go and view the film called The Sacred City. You can go into that website and you can go to look at the data that the data because we're trying to put up the data that we've collected and you can go and look at this uh, tool, the Kibla tool, and then you can can uh, look at all the mosques. Uh, it allows you to look down at mosques. You can zoom in and see them. And then there's uh, it gives you on the right information about the mosque. And there's even a more more info, so you can click on that. And we've tried to put up some extra information on each of these mosques. So you can look at, uh, uh, there's a lot of mosques listed there. So you could spend a lot of time going through this. So um, I'm just trying to share my screen with you as well, because it currently it's on um, YouTube, but you can't see it. Um, are you able to see my screen? I, no. no, I cannot see no. your screen. Okay, okay uh, don't worry about it. Just tell me what's on your screen. So what is in my screen is this website with the map. Okay. And in... In this map, what I have is, I can just go on site, and then it says... Now, on the right, it says by category. What category have you chosen? I've got, I've got Petra. Okay, so we can look at the mosques that point to Petra. Yeah. If you look there, we have the ones pointing to Mecca, to Petra, to Between, to Jerusalem, those that were parallel and unknown are... Other well-known mosques, but we cannot tell exactly where because they were rebuilt or something. But we still mention them because they are ancient mosques, but we cannot calculate them. This way, I have a list of all of the mosques from this period of time that I know of. Yeah. Okay, so you've pulled up Petra. So I've got I've Petra. Got, and yeah. then on the one side where it says city, you can know where this mosque is, what is the name of the mosque. Next right. to it, we have the date for like normal British date as well as Islamic date. Right. Okay? And also under it, we do have information of the coordinates as well as um, when you look at the direction of the uh, mosque, for example, the one I'm looking at it tells me. Which, I, I'm which mosque at, are you on? Cut Misha Church, but I can change that to something. Let me change that to. Um, Pick uh, Al Aqsa is down below it. Al Aqsa, yes. So okay, this mosque and is double du double click on Al Aqsa. Oh, got it. Yeah. 
Okay, now on the right in the box, you see the little red Petra, Jerusalem, Mecca. Yes. So those colors are the lines that are lined up over on the right. You can zoom in with, you've got a mouse to scroll. Yep. You can zoom in and look. So you can see the Dome of the Rock above, and you can see the Al-Aqsa Mosque underneath. Yeah. So. And so the Mecca line is green. You can see the Al-Aqsa Mosque is not oriented towards Mecca. It is actually oriented uh, more to the, much more to the south. So it is approximately 12 degree off from Mecca. That's yes. a lot of degree. Yeah, and from Petra, it is only uh, 3.4 degrees off yeah. of Petra. Yeah, so when you compare, it's like more towards Petra than towards Mecca, okay? Right. Let me pick another one. Have you got another okay, one? Okay, right line? right above it, you'll see where it says Jerusalem. Double click on that little red thing. That's the 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 dome of the chain. Yes. That's a very small little mosque beside the dome of the rock. Most people don't even look at it because they don't even know it's there. Apparently this is fourteen degree is off Mecca and one degree is of Petra, so it's more off. towards Petra. Okay, much more. Now, on the bottom, you'll see more info. Do you see where it says more info? Yes. Double click that, or just click that, and then you can see some pictures of it. It is a, a small dome, but it actually has a mihrab. You see uh, on the one side of it, it, it has direction. You can slide down on the pictures and see it gives direction yeah. to the dome of the rock. So, um, okay, you can, people can see that on YouTube as well. Okay. Um, okay, that, so this is how we use this website. So you just yeah. pick where you want to look, and then it gives you the dates. It tells you how many degree it's off, um, where it is more close to. Right. I think this is a very useful tool. And then if you want more information, there's often photographs we've been there or other information we've collected. Yeah, okay. So let me uh, try to get rid of this one and then go back to live stream page. Okay. Um, so now you, you went you went to the mosques, most of them. I think you were not able to go to the one in Saudi Arabia. That is correct. So as you uh, find the direction of the prayer, and then when you noticed actually they are missing Mecca, <laughs> not only yeah. like missing by a couple of degree, but like they are pointing Petra, which you had a knowledge of Petra um, very well. Uh, how did you feel? I, I didn't believe it. When I first saw this, I couldn't believe it. Um, it didn't seem possible. It was just, I mean, yeah, I mean, I first, and then I thought, I need to disprove this. I mean, it should be easy to disprove. I should be able to find information. I should be able to disprove this idea. And then I can just move on because, you know, you, you're not looking for this. I was simply looking for what points, you know, what faces Jerusalem. And I didn't find a single mosque that faced Jerusalem. They all missed Jerusalem. And that's when I did the lineup, I realized, because I have some mosques in Oman that were also, they said in Oman, oh yeah, we face Jerusalem. But when you look at it, they're facing to Petra, a mosque over in Cairo. Now the mosque in Cairo, we don't have the original um, uh, the foundation anymore. It's all been changed, but we do have a description of it. And they tell us there that people uh, prayed due east from this mosque. So I just took the mosque and drew a line east, and that's the direction they prayed, towards the east. And guess what's directly east of that mosque? Is Petra. So we have, you know, all of, we have these mosques here. You can go through and you can look at them. This is the first 70, 80 years of Islam. Everything points uh, towards Petra. Now, if you want, how accurate could they be? 
you can go down there and see they're all within a 30 or 40 kilometer range. So some are less accurate than others, but I mean, when you're facing far away, to, to be a little bit off is expected. I would expect up to eight degrees, you know, they could be off, and, but you'd still get an idea of where that mosque is pointing and directed. And you draw the line on the map and uh, you have a look at it, and sure enough, they are pointing to Petra. So the next question I had, because for me that settled the, the Petra question as far as archaeology was concerned. The next question was, what is there from Islamic history that will back up the, the, um, the Qibla that is facing towards Petra? Yeah. Because, I mean, the mosques are there. You can go out, you can measure them. You can argue a few degrees, but we have a lot of mosques that are, are facing this direction. We have zero mosques facing Mecca at this time. So Not a have, single mosque. We have physical evidence, physical buildings. We can go and see they are not facing the headquarters of Islam Mecca. That's but right. Those mosques are facing to Petra. That is and correct. Islamic tradition doesn't, uh, sorry, Quran doesn't talk about Jerusalem. No. The Quran simply says, um, Allah wanted to please Muhammad, therefore turn um, your uh, Qibla direction to Masjid al-Haram. Right. And it doesn't tell us where Masjid al-Haram is. It's, yes. So even though Quran is well detailed, well explained, kind of uh, misses those basics. So when you kind of put together yeah, it is interesting. Seventh century, first century Hijra mosques are facing to Petra. And since you have lived there, uh, was it easy for you to put together actually there is more than this going on? Yes, as I began to read Islamic history and as I began to study the Quran, uh, sometimes it would describe something and I'd go, I know exactly where that place is. Okay, I've been there. And so I could go, yes. And when it talked about uh, Abraham having been there and H you know, Hagar going there, and Hagar is uh, in, in this valley, and she goes to one mountain and she looks and she can't see, and then she goes to another mountain. I can picture that exactly. I, I could see exactly where she stood, and she's going over there to that huge cliff over there, and she's going to that cliff over there. And then it talked, Abraham came to talk with her, and then as Abraham left, he made a, he turned around the corner out of sight, exactly what you do in Petra, as you're walking towards the Thania that goes through the rocks, this crack through the rocks, it curves to the right first and curves around. And so as she's left there, Abraham leaves her and walks away, and uh, you could just see how this took place. So the descriptions of things uh, just fit, and I seem to to just really understand as I read it, and I could begin to say, okay, uh, I can see how this fits, but now we have to look at some other things. Uh, as an example, the, there's described numerous thanias going in and out of this city. Now, remember in the Quran, it, it speaks about the city, and in the Hadiths, they speak about the city of Mecca, because they are being written later, especially the Hadiths and the Hitch histories, they have forgotten the first location. So they use the words Mecca for both locations. There is an early Mecca and there is a later Mecca. And we can even find some Christian writing that talk about the city of Mecca being in Paran in Jordan. Okay, and so they're talking about the first Mecca, not the second Mecca. That's what many Muslims find confusing when they're reading their, their Qurans and when they're reading their histories. Is this talking about the first Mecca or the second Mecca? This is a new idea for them. But archaeology clearly shows there is a first Mecca and there is a second Mecca. And so, then we um, have to decide what is this verse talking about. Just a quick question. Um, you lived in um, Middle East, where yes. people's mother tongue is Arabic. That is correct. Uh, were you able to learn Arabic? Because I've got text, someone says, your English is very good, they don't believe you speak Arabic. Okay, I spent three years studying Arabic, 
And I am not an Arabist. I am not good at the Arabic language. I will tell people that. My wife, on the other hand, is an Arabist, and she's very, very good in the Arabic language. And so uh, when it comes, if I need an immediate um, uh, opinion on something, I ask my wife who can explain all the grammar and how the grammar works. She has taught Arabs uh, grammar and Arabic. She has taught uh, people wanting to be journalists how to speak correct Arabic and so forth. So um, I have that, but I also have many friends who speak Arabic and who have studied Arabic whom I can contact and uh, I can I can get multiple opinions on something. So I prefer to do my study in English, and I'll explain why. I'm sitting here behind me. I have, for instance, El Tabri up here in Arabic, and I have El Tabri in English. Yeah. Now, I also have him on my computer in English, and in English, I can search. So I have all my Islamic books in one subdirectory. Today, I was studying uh, Abraha, this guy from Yemen who came up with the elephants to attack uh, to attack Mecca, where, which what was it the first or the second Mecca? I can go into the electronic database and type in Abraha, and I it will list everything. The Encyclopedia of Islam. It will give me um, uh, Ibn Sa'd, Ibn Hisham. It'll give me Al Tabri, uh, all of these places, so I can get them. I can look at them in English. If I have a question about how a word is used. Then I can go over here and grab Ibn Hisham or Al Tabri or somebody else and go and check that reference in Arabic to see what does it actually say in Arabic. The problem with having books like this and wanting to search is how do you find in all of these books how many times Abra has mentioned? The there are very poor searches to be for the English for the Arabic language. And uh, it's very difficult because you have the middle letter and the, and the last letter and the first letter and how it looks. In English, it's much easier to immediately search, come up with the information you want, and then check the original. That is why I, I do my research in English first, and but I keep all the original Arabic uh, here so I can go back then and check the text to see what does it say. I do the same if I'm somebody asks me a question about the Bible. I can quickly search in English. Okay, here it is, because English has got amazing search abilities. And I can bring it up and say, here, now I can go back and check what does the Greek or what does the Hebrew say, and go back and check those texts. If I have a question, I know scholars and people who are fluent in both of those languages, have studied in them, I can go and ask them a question then, what do you think, what is your opinion, and I can get the opinion. So. English is the is the study language, and then we reference the original language after that for specifics. Does yeah, that question, explain it? Question is coming in the lines of. Okay. Um, so even though you lived in um, Arabic speaking countries, um, you need to know Arabic to be able to tell us where is the direction of the prayer in those mosques. That's the question is coming, but I think. You guys, you are just being unnecessary silly with asking that question. I don't want to be mean. Like I, right. I really don't want to be mean. But you don't. I need think to be, anyone you don't need can to speak. You don't need to speak Arabic to know where, which direction your gate is turning towards. You don't need to know Arabic. And one of the good thing is. Islamic sources are being translated to English. You cannot hide behind the Arabic anymore. And they are not only translated to English, they are translated to English by devoted Muslims. And yeah. I am not aware of a Muslim who told us the direction of the mosque is the number 5234 according to Arabic, but when they wrote it in English, they give us the wrong number. That's just like very, very silly argument if you are trying to make it. You don't need to know Arabic to find out what are the directions of the Qibla. Those are basics, guys. Like and this, and many of them are very obvious. Like if you go to Anjar up in, uh, in Lebanon, you go there, they not only oriented the mosque, they oriented the entire palace and the entire city towards their Qibla direction. 
every building, all the streets line up, everything lined up. And so you can, you know, you can look at it and everything has the same Kibla direction. So you can you can see it and it's easy to check. It's easy yeah. to measure uh, because it's there. There are a couple of mosques. Uh, the one in Humeima is a good example. Um, I've been there I've been, uh, many different times uh, because it was... Uh, I'm trying to think just to see where Humeima here. Kasar Humeima. Yeah, when it comes up, there are two things to measure here. The first one is the Kasar building uh, itself. This is where the Abbas family lived. Ju and, just, uh, a moment, just, just a moment. Let me just put, put it on the screen for everyone okay. to see. That's the mosque in uh, Jordan. Okay. In Jordan. Uh, and it's Kasar Humeima. Yeah. Can you zoom in on it? Can I zoom yes. on it? Yes, yeah, can actually. you roll your scroll up so you've got it till it's big? Till you can see two buildings that are quite distinct. The big one, and then off to the right, a smaller one. Can you see those? So, um, I'm zooming into the mosque. Okay. So, it's not a mosque, it's actually the building. This is the Qasr. Okay, it's a castle. It's the big house where everyone lived. Okay. And you can see that that building, uh, yes. has, that building has a direction. Yeah. That building we can date because that's the original building. Okay, and it has a direction and that entire building faces towards Petra. Now over on the right in the bottom, you see a very small little building. That is the mosque that was built later and that we can date later. And so that mosque faces towards, uh, more towards Petra, but it, it, it's a mosque that faces. Now, when I go to that mosque, and if you watch the documentary film, that is the mosque I'm standing in when I'm standing in this ruined mosque with the, with the, uh, uh, the mihrab and looking at the mihrab. That mosque there, you cannot measure the back walls or the side walls. You have to measure the Qibla wall because mosques are not always square. The, some of these buildings, they weren't worried about. As long as you got your Qibla wall straight, the other walls don't have to, to be exactly. So uh, you, we look at that and we can tell because there is a mihrab, there's the Qibla wall and that is the direction of prayer. So they had to build that Qibla later on because the original place where they prayed in the center courtyard of that big building, they could just all line up and face, they knew which way the, the Qibla was. Uh, that was no longer good enough. So then they created uh, another mosque outside. And so we have the early one there and we have the later one. In many places, we have this, an early mosque and then we have a later mosque. In the Wasit Mosque, there's an early mosque and there's a later mosque because uh, the early Qibla well, didn't point towards Mecca. So later on, they had to orient their mosques towards Mecca in Saudi Arabia. So, um I, I just love to um, explain this um, map to the, uh, those of you who are watching. So, green color, okay, this green arrow is where, like, arrow kind of goes towards Mecca. Red arrow goes towards Petra, okay? You can see the degree differences between them. And black and black is towards Jerusalem. Yes. So if you look at the degree differences between them, apparently it is approximately 138 degree different. When I make this map a little bit bigger for us to see, see this side, this yellow green arrow coming to Mecca, which is somewhere like down versus red is somewhere in the north. So person who build the mosque cannot only like, it doesn't look like they just missed with one or two degree. They missed with 138 degree. That, and then while it is close to Petra, it is not very difficult to come to the conclusion. Intention probably was to build towards Petra. And there is like 23 degree difference between Jerusalem to Petra. And um, 
so as you went to as people in so date of this mosque is 699 can you just uh, tell us a little bit what kind of methodology in that time people might be using to uh, build this mosque in towards Petra or towards Mecca wherever they wanted to build right. what was the like technology which we can kind of there were two things that are are used um, I don't ha- I've forgotten the Arabic terminology right now that uh, but there is one that uses the stars yeah. and then there's one that uses other things around that you can tell by So the stars are something that the Arabs used long before, and it's in there, uh, long before um, uh, other nations used it, because remember, they were merchants who traveled across the desert. The desert doesn't have any roads. And so if you were a merchant in Jordan and you wanted to go to Basra in, in Iraq, how would you take your camels across the desert and end up in Basra? And maybe you misread it and you ended up way up north somewhere, you know, or maybe you misread it and you end up somewhere way down in the south. So they needed to have a method to do it. And this, some of this method has been described to us by later writers. So I have on my shelf some of the later writers writing uh, later who describe what the early Arabs knew because some of it they still used. So I'll give you an example. If you're traveling north and south, they use the North Star. Now, as you are farther north, the North Star gets higher. As you go south, the North Star gets lower and lower on the horizon. The North Star does not move significantly. I mean, it does move a little bit, and they had ways of uh, talking about this, this movement of the North Star, but generally they measured it using your fingers held at a long distance like that. So if I hold up my fingers and I measure it from the horizon up to the North Star, this is called isba, which is fingers. And then each finger was divided into eight zams. And if you weren't sure your finger was exactly right, there were two stars up in the sky that were you could measure between them. That was the distance of a, of a normal finger. So eventually they would get a piece of paper and then they would slide it, I guess, this way up and down until they could get the measurement. And so they could measure. And so you have these measurements and we have maps that have the measurements north and south all marked out um, uh, exactly where. So you could tell how far north or how far south you were by measuring the stars up in the sky. So it just gives you an example. Yeah, also so anybody book, anybody could do that. Yeah, also in the book, um, we've got um, all the methods have been put together. Those of you who wants to kind of um, wants to look in deeper, please get the book. Also, I think you do have a couple of videos on this on your YouTube channel. So and I'm hoping to do something that. else. I'm hoping yeah. to do something more more detail soon. Um. Uh, sorry. Um, I'm just gonna keep eye on the chat to see if anyone has any questions on the topic which I can ask. Please don't send me uh, messages because it just gets me distracted. But if you have any questions, please put them on the chat. I can ask them. So when you um, when you figured out that actually there is something intentional happened, direction of the prayer was Mecca in the beginning but because you have a physical evidence now that it was those, Petra yeah. those mosques are facing to Petra uh, and you try to uh, discredit your argument by looking at the Islamic tradition stuff and what made you to see that you fail to discredit your argument well, everything I found supported the argument, not opposed it. And every time I looked at things, I, I would support. Now, once in a while, somebody would suggest something. I'd go, oh, my goodness, you know, maybe that does disprove it because I want something to disprove it. But then as soon as I looked at it, oh, OK, I, that's easily explained. Uh, an example is what do you do with the graveyards in Mecca? Because you have a graveyard for Abdul Muttalib. You have a graveyard for, there's seven early people 
that were supposedly buried in Mecca. Well, I heard this and I thought, oh my goodness, never, you know, okay, that disproves everything. Uh, then I started to look at who was buried in Mecca, and within a few minutes, I recognized one name because I knew I know where that person died. That person died in Gaza and is buried in Gaza, and there is a grave in Gaza. So how can there also be a grave in Mecca in Saudi Arabia? And that's when I realized these are not graves in Saudi Arabia. There are no history about this. These are memorials that have been put up. And in fact, the Saudi government looked into it, decided they were memorials, and they bulldozed that graveyard because there were some Muslims who were going there praying to these people in the graves, hoping they'd get some sort of blessing from it. So they were actually praying to Abdul Muttalib or wanting to be there to get something. And so the Saudis said, we don't like this. And so they bulldozed the graveyard. But they knew that these graves were, were memorials that were put up. They do not go way back into history. And there's something that people put up later. So I mean, another argument I get is what about Zamzam? Um, now you brought up an interesting point when you talked about 708. The year the mihrab was developed to yeah. point uh, in the right direction. In that year, Al Tabri tells us uh, that Zamzam was lost. No one knew where Zamzam was. That's a very interesting time because it's see it's at that time that the shift is taking place between Petra and down to Mecca in Saudi Arabia. And of course, the Zamzam that was up here was lost, and so they had to find and rename the well in Mecca, Zamzam. But there were a number of years in between when no one knew where Zamzam was. It's a very interesting thing. Now, the word Zamzam, again, I can go to my English and I can uh, uh, search. And I'm not only searching all the early Islamic documents. I have on there the uh, many Christian documents. I have the Gnostic documents. I've got uh, lots of documents from lots of different places. So I said, I want to go look on there, Zamzam. So where do I get the word Z-M-Z-M? And I did a search for it, and I found it only in one place. ZMZM -Z -M appears in the Bible in the book of Deuteronomy. And it says that there are people called Zamzimians who lived in Mount Seir. And Mount Seir is another name for the mountains where Petra was. And so these are the Zamzimians who live there. So if you're going to look for the well of the Zamzimians, where are you going to find it? You're going to find it in Mount Seir, which is Petra in Jordan. It is associated with the name ZMZM. So it just was another clue. That doesn't prove anything. It's just one more clue. If you've got a weigh scale and you're saying, well, here's this, and now I'm starting to put weights on this side, eventually the weigh scale is going to tip in this direction. And it took a while for me to be convinced. And so when I meet my Muslim friends and they first hear this, they go, oh, no, it can't be, and they get all upset. And it's like, well, it took a long time for me to see all the evidence for the weigh scale for me to tip. And so I'm finding more and more Muslims are looking. They say, I want to disprove you, and they start looking, and then they'll come back and say, boy, you know, there's so much evidence that supports Petra in Jordan, and there's no evidence that supports Mecca in Saudi Arabia at this time. And so the way scale tips, and eventually people come and get very excited and say, now I've got a new perspective on the early years of Islam. So um, I'm just going to try to understand something. So sometimes my brain just doesn't process well. Muhammad received his revelation in 630. That's correct. Sorry, 610. Yeah. In 600. Uh, Wait, where was where was Muhammad? Uh, that, that, I'm not going to go through that part. But, okay. Uh, yeah. As, as yeah I believe he was in Petra. So as he received his revelation, and then made according to the Islamic tradition, he drew to Medina, and then died in 632. Am I right to understand the mosques which you have looked that there is not even one mosque turning a direct 
has the direction of the prayer to Mecca until end of the first century, first century Hijra. That's correct. So there are approximately 20 mosques are turning their face towards Petra. That is correct. That is correct. Because that includes the amazed. time that includes the time of Muhammad, yep. of Abu Bakr, of uh, Umar, of Uthman. I mean all of these people if this if these mosques are correct, all of these people prayed towards Petra in Jordan. The change did not come until later. And I've tried to, when I started looking at history, I don't see the change until the second fitna or the second civil war. That is when the change took place. And I would go back and say, well, okay, my, I can tell by the mosques about when the change took place. What do I find? And so I went back and started reading. And what do I find? A man named Ibn Zubair. What does he do? He knocks the Qibla, down, the, yeah, the Qibla building down, he takes the black rock, and he puts it in a stand. Okay, so here we have the Qibla building is gone, and it's right in the middle of a war, and then we have a number of years, Al-Tabri is silent. They don't write what's in there. They don't tell us. They tell us very, very little, but what we end up with in the end is the black rock is down in... Uh, in Mecca in Saudi Arabia. And then we have a very interesting inscription. And this is an inscription just outside of Mecca. Um, it's at about 60 kilometers out. So it's the people who are watching since 78 after the Hijra. And it says, this is the year that Masjid al-Haram was constructed. Yeah. Now, can you believe that? 78 after the Hijra, and they say this is the year that uh, Masjid al-Haram was constructed. Now, I believe they're talking about Masjid al-Haram in Mecca, in Saudi Arabia. That inscription is there. There are photographs of it on the internet. People have studied it. You can go look at it. But for some reason, the people around Mecca say Masjid al-Haram was constructed here in 78 after the Hijra. So, that makes so that's our first clue. 697. That's right. That's our first clue that that the thing ha things that were switching towards Mecca and Saudi Arabia, and at the very same time we we're reading up, uh, we we're reading about the first Mecca and Ibn Zubair is destroying it, uh, what was there and everything else. Okay, so uh, the. Just this is just for those who might miss the importance of something. At the time of Muhammad, at the time of Abu Bakr, at the time of Umar, at the time of uh, Uthman, in the time of first caliphs, plus first century of Islam, there is none mosque, zero mosque, like zero is like none, okay? zero mosques are facing their prayer direction to Mecca. That is correct. I'm still looking. And if you find one, please send it to me. I'm still looking. I, we want to be able to check it and to measure it. So maybe that is, yeah, maybe that is like, um, but it will come up, it will come up since Muslims were conquering lots of part of the world. Even the mosques were in China weren't facing to Mecca. But I think it is amazing. Muhammad didn't have any problem praying direction of Petra. First caliphs didn't have any problem praying direction of K Petra. 21st century Muslims wants to pray towards Mecca. Yet Allah changed the direction of the prayer from somewhere to Masjid al-Haram to please Muhammad. And mm -hmm. today, archaeology tells us that direction was Petra. That's correct. And I, I expressed in a bit earlier that um, in the time of, uh, sorry, di different part of the world today, there are Muslims decided to pray towards 
Petra because they want to join in with Allah and please Muhammad. That's the direction of the prayer Allah gives to Muhammad. That's right. Now, what's interesting is when we go to Petra, we can begin to find the places there that are listed. Now, there's no sign that says this is the place. So, for instance, in the center of Petra, there is a square uh, building. There's the foundation of a square building, and uh, it looks like a Kaaba, but it's bigger than the Kaaba in Mecca by just a little bit. So um, one of the things I did is I checked with um, Azraki. Azraki is an early writer, and his family were guardians and, and managers of the, of the Masjid al-Haram. And he gives the measurements of the Kaaba building during the lifetime of Muhammad. When we take those measurements and compare that to the Kaaba building in Petra, the measurements fit exactly. There's the Kaaba Square building. Now the Hatim, the, the wall, that curved wall, is not attached to the to the Kaaba. It's it's back aways. And that's exactly what we would expect because it tells us one of the later caliphs attached it to the Kaaba building in Mecca. So we can go and find the Kaaba, the original Kaaba building. It's there. It has temples right around it. And so we, we've looked at that. And uh, you can go and find the, the two mountains with the road in between them where they would go back and forth on pilgrimage. Those mountains have at the top of them places for idols, just as it's described in the early writings, which uh, you can't find any of that in Mecca today. There is even a place where there is a, a huge flat platform with a column in the middle where people could throw stones at the column. It's there in Petra. You can go and find the camping places. You can go and find the Muzdalifah. This is the slippery slope going up the mountain. And there is a mountain there that goes up high where pilgrims would go up to the top of that mountain. And uh, there at the top of the mountain is both a mosque and also an ancient church. And thousands of people could could uh, stand up there. It's like a plane. I mean, you're going up a very high mountain, but when you get up there, five or six thousand people or more could stand all together easily up there because it's a huge area, and they could you know be at the top of this mountain, just exactly what is described uh, in uh, in the ancient book. So we've taken the pilgrimage of uh, that they did uh, from er the earliest times even up till today and we know we look to see well where did they start and then from the 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 water there's a place of washing there where they started and when they walk their way down to the down to the Kaaba building and then from there they go out to mean and they go back and eventually they go up to the mountaintop and back it all fits just as as if you had picked up the pilgrimage and dropped it down on top. So we can find all the different stations of the pilgrimage. We can find places that correspond to this in the city of Petra. And let me tell you something interesting. Did you know that people made pilgrimages to Petra up until 1985? That's when the Jordanian government passed a fatwa against pilgrimage to Petra and put a stop to it so no more pilgrims could go to Petra. So but can, up until then, there, again, there were still people going, 1985. Okay. Come to the website and look for the video on the, on the pilgrimage. Okay. And uh, you can check that out. So, I mean, the more we dig out, that's why this book here, Early Islamic Qiblas, it's out of date because we've learned so much more in the last four or five years. So, I mean, this is a good book. But we've added to it so many more things. But you will find in the back of this book, the Petra pilgrimages are listed here. Yeah. Exactly. But now we've gone through and, and checked out and found exactly where some of these places are. So we keep learning more. We keep digging deeper. And uh, we keep finding more evidence to support Petra than we do find evidence to support Mecca. And I could spend all night. We could spend all night talking here. But the best thing is to bring in some of these experts 
who can actually talk about these subjects as experts. For instance, in the Petra Scrolls, they're studying the language that was used there. Um, it was written in, by Greek characters, but it was Arabic words written in Greek characters. By, by going back and looking at that, we discover that they use the earliest form of Arabic, very similar to the Quran. They uh, use the uh, definite article of L, where if you go down to Saudi Arabia, in the early days, the, er, the definite article was HIN, H-N. And so um, it, the, the, the Quran doesn't fit any of the language used around Mecca by any of the Bedouin tribes or any of the old, old inscriptions on the wall. But where does it fit? The language of the Quran fits the city of Petra. And that's what that's just coming out in, in this last couple of years as uh, different linguists are studying and are saying this is where we find the original origins of the Arabic language. We're finding it in the area around Petra. So again, another supporting evidence. So not any of these single ones prove it, but when I take all the all the, the Qiblas, and then I ask, add all of these other things, like the language and all the various things. There's over 50 of those in, listed in that book of supporting yeah. evidence. By the end, you realize it, it's got to be true because I have got zero supporting evidence wow. for, for Mecca, except some guy writing three or 400 years after the events who may use the word Mecca but then we have to decide, is this the early Mecca or the late Mecca? Um, let me just bring up a question. Sure. Um, how old is the Saudi Mecca in Saudi Arabia? Is there any archaeological proof for that? Um, Are you aware of? Back in the year 2002, when I was doing this study for the Jordanian government, on the city of Mecca and on the the um, on the city, sorry, of Petra, yeah. and uh, I had we I attended a conference there. At that conference, there were a number of archaeologists from Saudi Arabia, and at this time, I was just asking questions, and so I asked one of these, uh, a couple of these Saudi archaeologists who were there. I said, "Tell me, what, are there archaeological evidences?" at the city of Mecca, because I read in this, about the wall that was around Mecca. I read about the temples that were in Mecca. I read about you know different things that were in Mecca, like what is in Mecca? And they looked at me and they said, are you going to quote us? I said, no, I just want to know. And they said, okay. They said, there's nothing in Mecca, nothing at all. And what's very interesting, I've been watching very closely, is the, uh, the building that has been going on in Mecca in Saudi Arabia, or those huge hotels that have been going up. And I've had opportunity to talk to some of the architects and some of the people who've been involved in the construction, asking questions, what are you finding when you dig those foundations? Are you finding any ruins? Are you finding any old buildings? And they said, other than that there's a Turkish fort that was there, and that's not that old, but other than that, there is no archeology span when we dig at Mecca, it's not there. I think so I've, I've heard it from the archeologists, I've heard it from the people who are digging the buildings, the architects who have worked in Mecca, and none of them are finding any ancient history uh, that goes way back. So it, it's supposed to have been a walled city with temples to all these different gods, and we're not finding any of those in Mecca and Saudi Arabia. I think that's very sad because Islam claims to be religion um, which is supported by history yet there is no archaeological evidence from the headquarter of islam for us to go and check it out as right. we more look into it we just see islam goes against history as well as just destroys the history like there is nothing islam can hold from the history for its accountability versus as we dig into the um, Christian archaeology, like British Museum is amazing. Uh, the play, the ar um, archaeological things they have in the museum regarding the confirmation of the Bible, event people and places. Like if Christian faith can stand on history versus Islam 
stands against history. I think as we look into more, more things will come up. Yeah. But I think. But tonight, but remember that missing evidence is not proof of anything. It's just yeah. we haven't found anything yet. But everybody's looking. Yeah. So okay. Like, Nowadays we're all alerted to this, so everybody's. But what we do find when we go to a Mecca in the region of Mecca is an inscription saying uh, that the Masjid Al Haram wasn't built until 78 years after the Hijra. I mean that's you know like that doesn't fit the traditional, but it certainly does fit the idea of them moving the black rock down to to Mecca and Saudi Arabia and. And people have asked, I've just done some videos on this, but I think they moved it to get it away from the Umayyads. They were fighting the Umayyads. I think they took the Black Rock. We have record of when they moved a bunch of people out of uh, Ibn Zubair, moved a bunch of people away. That's the year that's empty. Nobody wants to talk about it in Islamic history. And so they moved it down to Mecca and Saudi Arabia. Just the rock. Get the rock away. And so that rock was there for a couple of years, because that was about 70 after the Hijra that the rock was moved. And so it's not till eight years later that they build Masjid al-Haram. It Because the rock was just taken there, and I think as the rock showed up, and the people down there are like, oh, look, there's this rock here. And so people would go over to touch it and to see it and to worship it. And eventually, you know, they would be on display and then people would go. And so they'd have to have a restaurants and then they have to have a hotel up there because people are coming to see it. And so eventually they developed this Masjid al-Haram around the rock down in Mecca. And eventually people begin praying towards Mecca and Saudi Arabia. And there's lots of supporting evidence in early Islamic history talking about the traditionalists and the reformers. And we notice that the traditionalists give up or die out. And what's left are the reformers. And that's what we're seeing. The traditionalists who would have prayed towards Petra have died out. The reformers have taken over. And now uh, when the Abbasids come in, there's no question. Every Abbasid mosque uh, points towards Mecca and Saudi Arabia. That's where they pray. There's no question. And from that time on, everybody, when they talk about Mecca, they all the histories of both places just merge into one, and that's the place. So that's why you have Muslims today saying Abraham was in Mecca, and it, uh, Christians are shaking their heads, going, "When did he take a journey that far, and how could it fit into what we know of Abraham?" And it's way out of the way. And how do you get Hagar down in Mecca? In, in Mecca? And it just doesn't make sense. But the moment you move that story over to Petra it begins to make a lot more sense. Now it's possible. Lot's tomb is only 60 kilometers away where Sodom and Gomorrah is and so forth. So we have Abraham in the area. We have, you know, so Hagar was in that area. It's much more believable than uh, Mecca in Saudi Arabia. And so that's why the stories got moved. And today we're faced with uh, all of the stories together talking about Mecca and Saudi Arabia. And it becomes unbelievable. Yeah. So, um, um, I meant to keep you only for an hour. I'm sorry, it's like been more than an hour. It's um, okay. So, um, just for those of you who are watching, even though um, there are lots of new information which needs to be, needs to go into this book, early Islamic Qiblis, uh If you are working among Muslim people, if you are the group of people who desire, who wants Muslims to um, come to Lord Jesus Christ, um, I'll encourage you to get the book. Uh, learn it, look into it, and then ask basic questions to the Muslims. Um, and then also other book which we mentioned is the Quranic Geography. First read the Quranic Geography and then the um, Qibla book. They are very, very helpful. And then in the description of this video, you have links to the website, which you can go and check it. So those are and, the... And you can buy the books electronically, because the printed books are quite expensive, but you can get the download in electronic books at uh, a much cheaper rate. Yeah. Um, and, and also subscribe to Dan Gibson's um, YouTube channel, which as he puts the new videos that you will be up to date. Those are historical materials they get update very very quickly as in five years we might 
find 100 mosques facing the Mecca within first 20 years of Islam. So we don't know. But today, this is what we have. Today, this is what we have. And remember, helpful to remember, up to today, we don't have any mosque uh, facing towards Mecca as the direction of the prayer. Zero mosque from the first century of Islam. Islam. There is, according to the uh, archaeologists, there is no any artifact in Saudi Arabia in Mecca when you want to dig in to see what is that. I think those are kind of sad realities for today. But we don't know what will come up, um, what will be coming up next time. Um, I, so we only talked about the mosques uh, kind of focused on Me Petra, but there are actually four different mosques, direct, four different direction of the prayer. I am really hoping that we will have Dan Gibson back again to look at those and then see what, what else is happening in the world of Islam, what is happening in the first couple of centuries of Islam. Since history goes against Islamic tradition, and now we see archaeology goes against Islamic tradition, and it is very sad for Muslims, but those are good things for Christians because it helps us to have conversation going on between Christians and Muslims. There are many um, Muslims, though, who are open, wanting to know the truth. They want to know what actually did happen back then. So that's that's good. And I find that also among Christians. They want to know the truth. And so many want to know what happened in, you know, in biblical archaeology and what supports what and what doesn't. So I'm encouraged when people search for the truth and want to know. I want to know what happened, not just opinions. What can we actually learn about things? Because the truth is out there, and that's what we need to search for. Thank you. Okay. I think we will finish the evening um, now, but I'm really hoping we will have follow-up session of um, tonight. And then um, if anyone wants to um, ask their question, please just drop me email. And then um, when we come to the next um, live stream that we have the questions and then we can start from the questions so that we don't miss um, or we don't run over each other. That will be helpful. Um, for Great. that, please send email to info at dccministries.com. Uh, please subscribe to Dan Gibson's YouTube channel, which called Dan Gibson. Uh, and then get the books, get the, learn your history. Of course, as you look at the history of Islam, it will help you to question the archaeology of Bible as well as history of the Bible. So those are good materials for even us as a Christian. Yeah, we go into the archaeology of Moses and of David because these are all Islamic prophets as well. And so what has archaeology told us about these and what can we learn? So there's lots of interesting stuff there. Yeah, oh, well, we, will, we will dig into that and then we will look at, into that. Okay. Um, thank you very much all who joined us. Thank you very much who joined us through chat and also huge thank you to our admin um, who has been helping and we are very, very grateful um, that you made a time and joined us today. So thank you very I'm much. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. God bless you. Bye-bye.